Hey everybody, welcome back to the Quest for the Best. This is the podcast where us four backlog boys are trying to look at every single best picture winner, think about them, watch the films, discuss them even, and decide where do they go on a great big list of all the best picture winners. We're ranking them all in random order, and this time the gods of random chance have picked for us quite a film from 2014 Birdman, or in parentheses, The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance from Alejandro G. Iñárritu. Quite a, 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 I'm going to say it, quite a fantastic movie because um, I don't think that we'll have a lot to, we'll see, we'll see. No predictions beyond that off the, off the bat. <laughs> um, I want, I'm, you could tell, I want to talk about this movie. I got, I, I got some stuff to say. Um, but before we say our spiels, we got to do a little bit of housekeeping as is normal. Last week, of course, we talked about The Artist from 2011, gave it an average score of 7.8. And I highly go rec- recommend that you go check that review out because that film has a lot of interesting stuff going on and you can see who you side with. What do you think about this silent, this neo-silent picture? Um, quite enjoyable to talk about it and uh, make the make the episode it ended up at the 37th spot on our list which six sits at a total of 65 films and at the end of this episode it'll sit at 66 Hmm, funny how that happens all right tucker i believe you've got a featured comment for us and then we'll just roll right into this or fly right into this discussion about birdman yeah we've got a featured comment from our our second child dan's who comments i haven't watched this (laughs) Uh, now, that, that, that is his comment. I just wanted to do that because I thought it was kind of funny. Um, mm-hmm. But we actually have a serious comment from John Tour 11 who says, uh, What a fascinating experience this movie was. No sound made me feel like all my non-hearing senses were on full alert, which also makes me think that silent movies are a completely different form of art compared to talkies. I loved it. After that dream sequence, I was totally hooked. I think it was brilliant having a dog play one of the main roles. Dogs can't speak, so in a way, they are still living in the silent movie era. Totally Team Tucker here. 8.8 out of 10. Okay, there we go. Well, thank you, Jean Tour, for that elucidating comment. And, uh, well, puts that film into yet more perspective. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, let's do it. Let's talk about Birdman. Who wants to jump right off and get it all started? I'll go. Uh, okay, go ahead, Abram. Uh, <laughs> this was one of those rare Best Picture winners that I knew about and was actually on even my radar of things I wanted to see, but I hadn't seen it prior to watching mm. the film. And... I loved it. I think this movie is exceptional. Um, w- w- what struck me about Birdman is that it felt new to me. It felt like I was watching something I'd never seen before. Mm. And I really don't experience it, that too often, whether we're talking about Quest or, or otherwise, right? I mean, I've become jaded to film. I study film. I watch a lot of movies. I dissect a lot of movies. But I, I found myself um, really just surprised by the freshness of, of, um, of Birdman. And I was just wrapped up in the narrative and the performances and the tone and everything. I don't think it's perfect. I don't like the ending very much, and I'd like to talk about that. There's, there's individual scenes that I feel like I can pull out and, and criticize here, but I think that the overarching experience of the Birdman is so inventive and so poignant that I think it's truly fantastic. Well, first of all, I would like to recommend that you drop the the. Just Birdman. It's cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm, Abram, I'm going to differentiate from you a little bit uh, from telling you said that because I think that Birdman is perfect. I think this is maybe one of the very, very few examples that I've seen of an impeccable film. Uh, I watched this about two years ago. Tucker and I watched it in our in our first dorm room together at college, and I was blown away. I was blown out of the water by how brilliant everyone in this film is how every filmic element in this film how uh, how fine-tuned it is um and uh, going into it a couple days ago for for a rewatch i was blown away once again i think this lives up to every single standard that i felt the first time it is electric it is alive uh, and there's very few films that i can say that about that there's this is this pulsing energy within the film that really just locks you in. I don't have very many notes for this film because I was just locked in witnessing it again for what felt like the first time again. This was the third time that I saw Birdman and each time I go into it, I kind of resign myself to forgetting a few elements and letting myself be surprised again and again by, oh, I, I, I forgot about the scene where she sort of offhandedly tells him that she's pregnant, like I forgot about this sequence, I forgot about this, but every time I'm able to be surprised by this film, and along with Tanner, I really do think this is essentially a perfect film. I think the reason that I don't feel like I can pull out specific scenes and and criticize them is this film has 
in my opinion, absolutely 0% body fat. There is no fat on this film to be trimmed. And because of how smoothly it transitions from sequence to sequence, everything does feel like it's just one cog in the larger machine in a way that a lot of films feel like, okay, you've got a sequence, a sequence, a sequence. They can, they can be separated. They can lie next to one another. But this film is so intertwined in its storytelling and, and, and so perfectly paced because of that, that I really do feel like it's just one big snowball that keeps going and keeps going, and it's the tension of this film in all of its characters and the interwoven storytelling that I think makes it so unique and one of my favorite movies of all time. I, I really do think this is this is one of my favorite film experiences I've ever had. Yeah, I <clears throat> had never seen this film. Um, I had heard about it when it came out, when it was making its Oscar buzz, and when it won in uh, 2015 at the 2015 Oscars, um, and, and then I just didn't figure out a way to go like watch it for some reason um and so now i get to see it and man for a didn't know this was a movie about broadway didn't know that it was going to bring up all these really interesting stuff about art what is art what is like what is acting what is like what are movies versus theater and are you are you you know there's i think this film discusses really interesting and still important stuff about the mediums that we love and enjoy as well as being constructed this film is constructed i think in a really brilliant way you know the the gimmick of this film is that it is it appears to be one shot yet i feel like sometimes that can be uh that can cause films to feel a little weird and not play out the most in like the most naturalistic way ever and yet here it just feels like ah oh, i don't even notice at a certain point that it's all one shot because that camera's moving around and we're getting all this other kind of interesting angles and i mean i think there's in each element that we could pick out and be like Okay, for this thing, let's talk about themes. For this, let's talk about characters. For this, let's talk about sound. All of those elements the film exceeds in and is really, really good. Um, and I'm real. I, I'm curious to hear what Abram has to say about about the specific scenes because while I agree with Tucker that some don't, you know, they, that they don't like float out to me immediately, I think that um, that perhaps there's a little bit of room to like you know negotiate with ourselves about what this film is saying and and everything that's going on in it. But all in all, I was fully enraptured and well, um, ah, just fun and interesting and tense and drew me in. Yeah. A great movie. The, the thing I want to say about the quote unquote one cut, get one take gimmick is that what it does is not, it's not obviously it's not actually one take. That's not possible, mm -hmm. but I think the film knows that's not possible and uses its one take nature to, to play with time and space in a way that makes things really interesting. It goes from one take of the, of the film, or the camera moving from upstairs to downstairs, and in a way, it just cuts out time between sequences that makes it feel like everything is connected, even when there's probably hours in between some of the things that happen in this in, in quote-unquote real time within the film. So so also the shot where it pans up to the skyline, and then time-lapse, boom, 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 nighttime, mm -hmm. morning. And then you mm -hmm. pan down, and of course, that is all one shot, quote-unquote, but it's mm -hmm. passing an entire night's worth of time, but because it's not showing any of that in any large way it feels like there's such a good momentum leading from an end of an end of a sequence where characters are having an emotional moment give it like five to ten seconds of, of downtime of the camera like going down the stairs or, or or panning or doing something and then boom right into another sequence i yeah, think and... i think you're totally right but but i think that there's also actually a different effect that i really appreciated about this this the one shot which is that if you're doing one shot like this, you have to choose what you show in each sequence, and there you cannot you cannot intercut. There is no intercutting. Yeah. So oh, the, true. Great point. The the example that I love is after, God, my stomach hit my 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 shoes when the door <laughs> slams on his robe, and it's, oh, it becomes clear that he has yeah, to yeah. run around and get back in. And what I think is so powerful is that that moment when our main character Riggin gets back in and he's pretending he's got the finger gun and it's this real point of emotional confidence and, and chaos in the film. But then that one take camera moves to follow uh, Jack, Jake, moves to follow Jake, who is, who is like the producer overseeing the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't see that scene actually unfold. Mm -hmm. We follow Jake up and then the camera just lingers on an empty hallway and we hear the scene conclude elsewhere. I think it's so powerful yeah sound sound mode going crazy right now <laughs> it's so it's so powerful when you have to so deliberately decide what is shown because you have so much flexibility in editing to break yeah. time to break continuity but you can't do that here and it leads to really interesting creative moments like that 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I feel like the permutations of that just expand like crazy. You know, a film, I think I, I'm going to make this comparison, 1917, other uh, contemporary mm, film yes. that does this long take. <laughs> and I, I like that film, but man, this does the one take so much better i don't and and i i have yet to like fully develop my like reasoning why that is but i just feel like i don't i don't ever lose anything really i just like get in and i'm it's it's very 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 immersive in the way that it it like like the the filmic narration of this film um and yeah i like man this one take works so well and it there's never you know there are times i could tell when they're like changing shot whatever don't care you have to do it Mm. You know, your the lay audience probably doesn't notice that, and that's how it's supposed to be. So that's fine. Yeah. Um, surprise, surprise! I also love the one take nature. Uh, the 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 faux one take of Birdman. Um, I think you guys all brought up fantastic reasons why I love it. I also love it because it mimics or it, it sort of blends together these instances of reality off stage and on the street and the fictional goings on on stage in the play and that very much mimics uh uh uh, uh, uh Regan Regan Thompson's psyche because uh, yeah. that's that's basically his whole issue in this film is he he's having trouble differentiating between fiction and reality you know because that he's trying to part and th- this gets into uh his, his character a little bit more which i think you know we'll, we'll obviously get around to it, it his his character flaw essentially is that you know he's he's a he's a falling star you know he, he he's falling out of favor in the in the public eye and he's trying to prove to himself that he is still worthy of being a name and a, a name in people's minds having that fame or if you want to go even deeper, being loved on some level. I mean, that is, that's the whole crux of the play that they're putting on. Oh, you know, what we talk about when we talk about love. Um, but he's pursu- he's an actor, and he's an artist, so he's pursuing that through fame, popularity, and uh, transitioning out of that and going to the theater with prestige and critical acclaim and things like that. And I, th- it, 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 it's breaking his psyche that he, you know, he's pursuing these things in both elements of his life uh, uh behind the, or yes off stage with his daughter with his uh his his ex-wife, ex-wife and yeah. his ex-wife and then this woman that he got pregnant but then she had a miscarriage or something of that nature uh and he's also pursuing it on stage with the art critic and trying to uh, compete with Mike Shiner as this like big time Broadway actor who's real and he's trying to ask himself what does it mean to be real what does it mean to emote truly on stage how do I give people what they want by staying true to myself and that really gets to the heart of why I love Birdman so much is the characters involved the character writing and how that all weaves into what the film is saying I think is brilliant I think it's I think it's interwoven to a level that few films that i've seen are interwoven before you know the characters and the themes and then you know you layer that on top of the filmmaking fundamentals and everything it's brilliant so yeah that that's what that's really what i have to say about you're that. right and to, because i won't have very many other opportunities to talk about how i don't like 1917 i'm going to use that as an oh, sure, way to do sure. so yeah the, the reason that for me because i think it's important we, ad- we address the gimmicks so we're talking about some gimmick films here on the program Mm-hmm. The reason that I think this transcends its gimmick Ooh, and it just die. and it becomes just a facet of the experience is because it isn't like 1917 wherein I think that the one shot is why 1917 is special. Mm-hmm. The characters, the plot of that film are not particularly remarkable. Now mm-hmm. I like young Samuel Mendes. I think he makes very good movies. <laughs> but but I think that when you're doing something as bold as the pseudo one shot, it's easy to become wrapped up in the in the notion that this is your movie. And I think in the case of 1917, that is the movie. Now, of course, it serves the function of having these men be always on and build tension. But I think it comes at the cost of characters and narrative and plot and everything, but I don't think that's the case in Birdman. Because I think that while it would be less effective, you could just tell the narrative of Birdman traditionally framed, traditionally edited, and it would be not as compelling, but still incredibly compelling. Because the film has a lot to say, and I think that's what I really want to talk about. Yeah. I think what uh, where Tanner kind of started and then sort of went into to more character elements of the film, mm. but I do want to tie it back around one more time to the one shot, is why the one shot works to heighten the themes and the character arc is because, as Tanner was saying, there is a... It's hard for us to perceive the differences 
between reality and fiction because there are no cuts. You don't cut to a different sequence. Oh, this is the dream sequence. Oh, this is the part where he is is uh, is acting out his internal dialogue with with the Birdman um, figure that's following him or any of that. That just happens in the progression of the film. The camera turns and we start seeing that. There, there's no breaks. That makes it some, sometimes hard to tell whether you're going into a sequence where something uh, uh, something of a heightened reality is going to happen or not. And and that tension keeps you in the mind of Reagan, who, as, as Tanner was saying, has a mm -hmm. hard time discerning between reality and fiction. And of course, he is developing some sort of mental illness where he uh, can't quite keep his mind on one track. And obviously that shows through his dialogue, which I think is another excellent part of this film. But it, it's all tied back in to the filmmaking where we as an audience are able to to get into that mindset because there are no cuts, specifically because of the, the one take nature. Mm -hmm. uh, just want to point out a oh, trivia thing. There are 16 cuts in the film. Uh, that, That's that not get. a lot. No. Absolutely not. Whew. And uh, it, another piece of trivia is that uh, in the, you know, this movie runs for two hours. There are 16 cuts. In the one minute and 47 second premiere trailer, there are 30 cuts. Oh, Ooh. interesting. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So the the full film has like half the number of cuts that the trailer does. It doesn't and, even go for two minutes. And I assume that that's not including the intentionally cut footage at the end of the film. Uh, I would have, well, it, it might. I, I honestly well, couldn't tell Well, that felt like more than 16. Well, because the reason I brought oh, it up true. is... Oh, true. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beca because I'm a shithead, I was trying to look and notice where they were cutting, just to be like, yeah, oh, I caught you, I caught you. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And you can do it if you know how a camera moves. Mm -hmm. But to Timo's point, and I, I don't think it's even just the, like, the, like the average film viewer who wouldn't notice this, because frankly, I'm not sure how many average film viewers really care about Birdman, mm. but, but I think they do a, a smart job... Even when you can tell that continuity is being broken, like like filmmaking continuity, it's really hidden well. There's only a couple points where I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe the camera is lingering here a little bit too long. I, I think my favorite instance of how hidden and how seamless it is is when um, um, Emma Stone's character and Ed, Edward Norton's character are getting it on up in the rafters, and the camera goes up and down smoothly, and he's down there. Edward Norton's mm -hmm. character is down there. An indiscriminate amount of time has passed. We have no yep. idea. And you you saw him upstairs and you see him downstairs and it flows <laughs> so seamlessly between scenes that you, you have to sort of like reset your mind like, wait, hold on. Oh, he was just up there. So that means that time yeah. has passed. But because of the one take, you're like, oh, oh, oh shit, that happened. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it functions very well to move us through the plot. And I, I don't think that the cuts matter at all. And like the story is is so strong that we're never paying attention to any of that. I like I'm paying attention to it in like the imagine the left and the right brain. Whatever side is supposed to be like the logical like figuring figuring yeah, shit outside is like, "Oh, what how did they cut?" And then the the other side is like, "Okay, wow, well, hmm, plot and characters and themes." Hmm, yeah. you know, that kind of. And so I am the the like the the f emotional feeling side of my experience of this film is definitely the overwhelmed the overwhelming portion. I'm not paying attention to these elements beyond when I'm like noticing them for their benefit. It's all in what are these characters saying? How are they acting? You know, we got to talk about the performances, the performances mm -hmm. within the performances. I I I think that yeah, all of the film has so many legs to stand on, I think. There's so many different elements that really just support it, and we could pick any of them and talk about any of them for hours, probably. If we if we can go right brain for a little bit here and talk about you know, themes and characters and whatnot, I think an appropriate place to start, and I, I, I started down this run a little bit, is with Michael Keaton portraying Regan Thompson. Because, first of all, going going broad here what a brilliant idea of casting to cast batman in what is essentially a guy who used to be batman role yeah. i mean uh they have the they have the line where they're having the press conference in his in his dressing room or whatever he's like oh you haven't played batman since 1992 which is when batman returns came out the last time that michael keaton portrayed batman um it, it, it's a very clear intentional choice to sort of you know bring about those uh bring about those concepts of like an actor you know st going from blockbuster stuff to uh artsier stuff you know uh and you know in this case he's going to theater which i don't think that michael keaton has done um but i, I just love that idea of cat of casting that person to sort of break down those walls of <laughs> excuse me good god 
break down the walls of like fiction in your audience's mind because they do that you know at numerous other points too when they're listing off actual real stars there's like oh woody harrelson oh he's in hunger games oh uh jeremy renner oh he's an avenger or whatever yeah. i love i love that kind of stuff because it, it 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 cuts to the heart of like what these characters think of um you know these low art films in their world which is essentially our world too so it, it allows us to relate those things but to get going around to talking about michael keaton more generally um, he does, and obviously, an outstanding job in portraying a Regan Thompson who is having this psychotic break, who's believing that you know he's he's like moving things with his mind and and things like that. He's having conversations with the Birdman persona, which is like his his deeper his deep seated uh, like super ego that's telling him you're better than everyone else. You still got it. 60s the new 30. You could go back to being Birdman. You'd have pimple face geeks cream in their pants or whatever. Yeah. And uh, he's like people love this shit. They love action and explosions. They don't love this depressing talky shit. I love that that he's do that he can do both both of those things and he has this conflict within himself and with um everybody else in the movie because I think there's such an intricate puzzle that is laid out with all these characters, their egos and their ignorances, their virtues of ignorances and things like that, their wants and their pasts and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I want to hear what you guys have to say about Michael Keaton in this movie. Well, so the, 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 I think here's what I have to, here's why I think that the, the, the themes and the characters work so well. It's because everybody gets shit on by, by the film's messaging. Mm. And I think that's really exciting. Because Michael Keaton, there's there's like there's like three different. It's much like Don't Look Up, if you will. Yes, films of equal writing quality. Mm -hmm. You you you've got like you've got Ed Norton, uh, Mm -hmm. as as what is his name? Mike Shiner. Mike Shiner. You have the the critic for the Times, and Mm -hmm. you and you have Reagan. Yeah. And what's great about that is that you've got all these different poles of like of. Of, of of righteousness, you've got you've mm-hmm. got the Hollywood man heading into Broadway, you've got the you've got the real the the actors actor, mm-hmm. and then and then the gatekeep girl boss. Here's what art is, <laughs> and everybody ends up looking terrible. And I think that's yeah. why this movie is so interesting in its messaging because we we have this really hammy stuff about Birdman being behind him and that completely over the top awesome just CGI laden mm-hmm. cluster of, of trucks <laughs> blowing up and the big thing up on the building right mm-hmm. so it's it's critical and it's poking fun but it does the same to everybody and that leaves the reason I don't like the endings I want to talk about is that we just start whacking the the, the viewer with a stick over the head but I think what's so uh, but what, what's so nice about the messaging on the whole is like you have to navigate through this and it's not this is not the oh superhero movies are bad blockbuster s- storytelling is bad right yes and, but it's also not the, the it's it's not saying our savior here look look at ed norton who by the way the hulk very mm-hmm, I, exactly. that's another yeah. fun like because they mentioned by name here's rdj here are yes. these avengers and then here's Woody Harrelson, but this isn't Ed Norton. This is Mike Shiner. So that's a fun little bridging. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm getting a little cyclical. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to shut up. But I just like that everybody is in the line of fire in Birdman. I really yeah, yeah. appreciate that as well. Me being a big fan of this uh, heated, hateful debate between of uh, <laughs> in between cinema heads about about uh, w- the value of blockbusters and comic book franchises films. Um, I feel like this this Birdman has a really intelligent take on the whole thing where it's like, yeah, this guy pulls in tickets. Yeah, he's like, he's a big star. Well, oh, okay, now he wants to go do real art. And what does real art look like? Everyone is just pretentious as fuck. Everyone is just like not nice. Everyone's asshole. Egos abound. This is, you know, you have your theater. The, the your theater people, theater people be like this. So worse. <clears throat> I don't, no, but I, 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 I think... Sorry, yeah, finish. I'm not gonna hate on all theater people. They're 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 fine. They're all fine and cool cool individuals. <laughs> um, but I do feel like you're exactly right in that it it slings the mud all around and really paints this complicated picture of what in what is like our modern form of art and really what is our modern form of acting because this is this is feels like an actor's movie a lot and a mm-hmm. lot of a, an exploration of anxieties that actors find themselves having and and 
and how we can kind of glimpse into the mind of an actor i think we get a couple different minds to look into and those are some some of my favorite character moments mike shiner being like i'm i'm, I'm only real when i'm on the stage the mask is on mm-hmm. when i'm off great scene yeah. great scene really awesome to just explore all of these elements of our media industries it's a good topic i think it's especially a a good topic that works on both both levels you're talking about how it quote unquote shits on every subsect of the industry, um, which I think is, is a very powerful way to not make this a clear story. Like you're not clearly supposed to side with Reagan because he is, he's not a great dad and he was abusive to his wife. And like, it makes everything really complicated. And especially because there, I don't think there are any characters in this movie that escape without some form of criticism. Maybe Naomi Watts character as as she's just kind of like innocent. But other than that, Everyone has some aspect to their character that makes them a little like uh, I don't I don't want to side with this person because if I do I'm allowing them to get away with this and so it feels like a powder keg. This whole movie is a powder keg filled with little bouncing balls of of powder uh, inside the keg, um, where I, you mm-hmm. know that it's just going to boil over and it never really does. I'm sorry, uh, Tucker. It, the keg does not boil over. Ah, okay. You know, this. I'm mixing my metaphors here. It's totally uh-huh, fine. Uh-huh. It's all mixing in the powder keg. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's it's a really interesting way to portray tension because you aren't given any time to relax. There's no relaxing, re- really no relaxing moments in this movie because you always know something's going on in the background. You know, someone's about to get mad. You know, something's about to go wrong. And you're just navigating along with the characters as everything spirals slowly but pretty quickly out of control and 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 things just constantly go wrong and and i think it it really keeps me kept me engaged where i never felt like i could back away from the story because there was there was going to be no moments where the the characters were going to sit back and like have a beer and and laugh for a scene like no we're going to go to riggan being sad in his in his um green room behind the scenes and that's not relaxing because now you're learning about his past where he abused his wife and he wasn't a great father it's like there's no downtime in this film, and I think that's a really interesting way to portray tension. Yeah, uh, well, I think it was, uh, I think Abram and Timo, you, bo- you both brought this up, about what this film has to say about high and low art, and how Regan and Mike are really, you know, two sides of you know, the the Hollywood guy turned Broadway and the true Broadway actor. And uh, I'm, I'm, gonna tr- I'm going to attempt to tie these two things together to make a cohesive statement, so here we go. I think what the film is saying about, you know, high art versus low art or our conceptions of those at the very least is that when you break it down to a certain level that this film does, there is no difference. It's all about, you know, putting yourself out there and trying to find validation from some sort of audience. Whether that audience be pimple-faced geeks creaming their pants whenever they see an explosion or some jaded New York Times critic who only appreciates true acting that is actually miserable miserable people putting themselves out on stage in front of 800 people because that's the only way they can feel something in a way there is but there is there's the value in both of them when you get to the human level is the same it, it is both people looking for validation of some kind it, and that's obviously looking at it through an acting lens because this film is very much about um, I, I think this film can be a, can be applicable to everyone, not just actors. But it takes it, it says these things through the lens of acting, because you know, in a lot of ways, the world is a stage, and aren't we all acting in our lives every single day? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, it's a very human thing to look for that validation. You, 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 we do that every day when we interact with other people, and we we try to be things that people will like us to be. And, you know, we, we so humans search for truth in these in, in you know, trying to adapt themselves and, tr- and finding different groups to to cater themselves to. And that's what actors do in, in high versus low art. And, you know, obviously, I I started out this meta, I started out this talking about Regan Thompson and Mike Shiner because I, the, that is to a T what those two characters are. You have Regan Thompson, who is looking for that validation. He finds he he's empty when it comes to, um, you know, the Hollywood Hollywood art, uh, Hollywood blockbusters, and he and he's searching for something a bit deeper, or what he conceives to be deeper in in Hollywood or in in Broadway, I guess. And Mike Shiner, it, whenever they interact, it's very interesting uh, because when it, when Mike interacts with the Regan, he's very much putting on these airs of being the actor's actor, but he's honest 
with Sam, which I think is very interesting. Sam being this very nihilistic 20-something, she's jaded because social media, everyone is special and therefore no one is special, so why not just do drugs and acting doesn't matter, life doesn't matter, whatever. And Mike seems very optimistic when he's with her you know he 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 envies that sort of that youth that she is rejecting that youthful optimism that she's rejecting when he says like i wish i could take your eyes out and put them in my skull and look at the look down at the street how how i saw it at your age i just think it's super super interesting how each of these characters interact with what the film is saying not only about acting but about how we how we perceive the world and how we want to be perceived. I think it's super, super interesting and super well done. Tanner, you're going too deep. You're overthinking it. This oh. movie is about the power of TikTok. Oh, my mistake. My mistake. See, what, what I like about this movie is that not only do I feel like it's casting the blame everywhere, but it is inviting structured and different interpretations. We can go down the avenue you're going down, but then you can go down the avenue of, well, the only time that Riggin, because the ending is ambiguous as to if it, if it even happened, mm -hmm. um, the only time we know for a fact in the context of this world that people are talking about Riggin Thompson is when he is in his underwear running around and he goes viral on social media and then he's mm -hmm. talking about it on the news. Yeah. And so I think you can read it in this light about optimism and finding purpose and everything, but I think you can also read it as literally nothing matters and it's just a cynical, dark comedy. And I find that to be a real testament to, to the script here that I think both interpretations are held up by the context of the film. Mm -hmm. I, I often find myself entering a film that has ambiguous theming and uh, attributing that to an, uh, just a, a, too much ambiguity in the script. But I don't think there is a lot of of, un, of unintentional ambiguity here. And that's why I think Birdman works, because I can read it because I'm unhappy with everything that's happening in my life as I'm here in COVID mm -hmm. isolation. I can read it as <laughs> nothing matters, everything sucks, you're only famous when you're running around in your underwear. But you mm -hmm. can take something deeper away from it, too. And I think that's the sign of yeah. a well-written movie. As, as Inurito himself said, there are as, as many interpretations of this film as there are seats in a theater. That's true. That's a real quote. It's a real quote. So there's a finite number. Let's come up with all of them right now. Yeah, here we go. Okay, guys. We're marathon in this thing. 12-hour <laughs> quest episode. Yeah, yeah. The thing that I want to say about the dark comedy aspect of it is another reason why I love this film so much is it's talking about all this stuff. It's got these deep themes, got these deep characters, and it, on the whole, it's pretty nihilistic. It's a pretty negative film. But it's also a really funny movie. Like, it knows... That yes. what it's saying and the characters that it's doing are ridiculous. And and the way that they bounce off of one another leaves leaves time for you to laugh at almost everything that they're doing. And I think that mm -hmm. it, it leaves a levity to this stuff that makes it easier for me to swallow, but I but I think in a good way, in that mm -hmm. you're able to balance all these emotions inside of this powder keg with, with some jokes and some laughs um, that are also played into by what is essentially just always drumming you up to to have a um like a ba ch which is the percussion score mm -hmm. uh, and and the way that the score basically only stops when it's a very serious moment or a very funny moment and mm -hmm. and I think that it always uh, we can talk about both these aspects separately but I love the way that they work together in in terms of they know when the dialogue is funny enough to let you just focus on that and it's very interesting yeah, uh, if I may, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a wins and noms thing here because there's an interesting okay. and a, a bit of an in depth uh, piece of trivia about the score, and I'm gonna use this opportunity. Uh, this film or this score for this film was not in consideration for best score at the Oscars or the the year it was not the year that a Birdman came out because I, I I I was reading through this, I was trying to understand it. I think that the score is um, not wholly original. I think there's some bits of pre-existing music that are used, and uh, but not completely. And for that reason, the Academy um, disqualified it. Uh, Inuritu and the person who did the score, uh, just hang on, I'm trying to find the person who did the score. Uh, basically, uh, the Inuritu and the composer basically appealed this decision to the Academy and said like, hey, there is there, there, there's a, a great solid amount of, of original score in this. Could you please consider the consider the score and they're and the academy basically said back to them hey listen you guys have a great score they call it superb one of the best of the year but we can't consider it sorry 
Mm. So just just a bit of uh, academy fuckery there. Yeah. And uh, I like I like when how on a number of occasions we see the drum player, we see the dude yes. who is doing the score. If, we were like, it'll be like chilling, from chilling from diegetic to yeah, non diegetic. It's he'll great. be chilling in the hallway, drumming along as Michael Keaton walks past, and he does. I mean, is there does Michael Keaton even acknowledge him? I feel like no, there's like of course not. no. Okay, but we see him, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, hmm, okay, awesome. Yes. Uh, Antonio Sanchez is the composer for the film, so my my condolences, uh, Alejandro and and Antonio. But uh, if I can go over to the wins and noms in total, oh boy, I, I've lost. I'm, I'm a lot of sorts here. Okay, I here got them actually. You want? Them? I got I got them pulled up right here. I found them. No, good. it's all right. It's all right. Uh, this film obviously won Best Picture. Yeah, uh, Alejandro G. Inarritu also won for Best Director. Uh, Inarritu, G- oh, Gia Cabone, Dineris, and Bo won for Best Original Screenplay. Uh, the film won Best Cinematography and was nominated for Michael Keaton for Best Lead Actor, uh, Edward Norton for Best Supporting Actor, Emma Stone for Best Supporting Actress, uh, Achievement in Sound Mixing, and Achievement in Sound Editing. That was yeah. back in the good old days when they were separate oh. awards. Right, Timo? Mm, the, the, the good old days, yeah. And we'll talk yeah. about... Timo, Timo get this shot of adrenaline, of, more, of not morphine, but what, dopamine? Is that the good yeah, one? that's the uh, one. Whenever he hears the fact that they were separate at one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can talk about the sound when it's time when we do the when we do the filmmaking fundamentals. But the thing that you 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 mentioned the um the acting noms, and I, I'm a little you know mm-hmm. I'm a little sad that that they didn't win because even though I don't have the greatest recollection of the rest of the nominees and the winners from this year, 2015's Oscars, mm-hmm. um I really think the performances in this film are just like stellar. Somehow, Absolutely. somehow there are scenes. Where like Michael Keaton, he is acting, right? He is acting the whole movie because he's an actor and playing a fictional character. And then he will go on stage and be like prompted by Mike Shiner to like act better. And his Mm. acting like improves. And I'm like, what? How does he go from like already portraying this really convincing character? And then he shifts into this like this it's like theatrical. But when they're just in that like rehearsal space right next to each other, just in on it it doesn't even feel like theatrical acting it just feels like these like really raw really true emotions are coming out as they're like yelling back and forth and they're kind of like playing with each other and deceiving each other just the scenes of actors doing their thing doing the the acting i are some of my favorite just to watch of a pure uh like pleasure value because how do you how do you get how do you take really how do you take like acting that i like i don't know how to improve and then you do you improve it i masterful oh speaking of um improving things one of my favorite scenes is uh when edward uh, when mike shiner and brigan thompson are you know working through that 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 like single moment in the script and they work it down to something that's much tighter and cleaner and better because you understand in that moment that mike shiner is a good actor and he understands scripts and he understands what to say on stage like he's not some phony guy he yeah. is a very good actor and a better actor than Regan Thompson is, at least on Broadway. Um, and but you also, you know, through because that's like your first introduction to him. He's like, oh, he's a pretty cool guy. But then obviously you, you come to learn over the course of the rest of the film that he's a huge asshole that uh, I love the, the uh, a subsequent scene where <laughs> he's fighting with uh, with Regan and he's and like leopard print uh, mankini or whatever. That's I love the thing of Michael Keaton just pop. Popping right in the nose, and he and he falls to the ground, and then they obviously they wrestle. Uh, that's a that's another element of the dark comedy that that is present in the film because before that happens, it's Michael Keaton like going into this uh, this basically this sob story about how his dad abused him and like sexually assaulted him, and my and Edward Norton's like, oh, uh, gee, man, I'm sorry, I didn't know that, and he's like. I got you. I tricked you. Yeah, I got you. I made you believe it because I'm a good actor. And yeah, yeah the, the great, great dark comedic moments there. I think Edward Norton makes the movie for me. Yeah, I, I think he is awesome. I think he's written really smartly, and I think he just gives a fantastic performance. But everyone, everyone is great, but he he's he's this continual source of chaos mm-hmm. that is established really early. Not only with the scene of him coming in and knowing already knowing the part and being like, yeah, I'm going to change your script. But as soon as he ruins the preview, I think that's one mm. of the best moments of the film because I didn't realize at first that like that's not supposed to happen. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, but, but the way 
yeah, the way he's just like a brick through the window and he's like, oh, fuck it. It's just a preview. Who cares? He, yeah. he, he's, he vacillates between all these extremes of, of extreme pandemonium and calm. And it just, he's this continual, uneven, but continual just force throughout the entire film. And he really does make it because he gives, because Michael Keaton, I think, is good. But I think mm. Michael Keaton's best when he's working off of stuff. Yeah. And I think working off of Ed Norton is, 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 Mwah. That's A1 mm-hmm. Birdman. There I think the go. reason that I would I would push back a little bit against that uh, the comment against Michael Keaton, because I'm not saying you're saying he's a bad actor, bad in this movie, whatever. No. But is that every part of this movie is interaction between characters. There are no monologues. There's The only scenes we see Michael Keaton by himself is when he's interacting, quote-unquote, with Birdman. So he's having conversations. So every moment in this movie, I think every character, every actor is doing such a top-notch job that there's no there's no space to get worried about, oh, is this character arc not going to play out? Is, is this going to happen? Because you're always getting... Tension. It's always sandpaper, rubbing against sandpaper. And, and you're always waiting for the next set of character interactions because this character knows this about this character. And, and you can't wait to see that play out a little bit later in the script, but you're so invested in what's going on on the screen right now because they're not giving you any time to breathe that boom, 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 everything just keeps layering on top of each other. And and I do think that Edward Norton is sort of the catalyst for all this, but I do think that for me, um, Michael Keaton as Regan Thompson is, is that through line, is that force because learning about his internal anxiety and how he's responding to Mike Shiner's ridiculousness is what gives his ridiculousness uh, a gr- like a groundedness. Like if it's just Mike Shiner as this asshole wacky actor, that's like almost cartoony at that point. But when you're seeing the impact of him uh, standing up with a boner or him throwing the thing against the wall with the, with the gin, those moments have weight in the larger story and then it and then it grounds them down again, and I think that's the the balance that it strikes with the crazy comedy wackiness because uh, it is. But no, there's there's real impact when someone goes off the rails like that. I just yeah no I think you're definitely right. I think what I would just clarify is that I think that the scenes between between Riggin and Birdman work best because it's the concept of him speaking to sure. Birdman. Yeah, I think that the movie has a lot more energy when it's somebody else, obviously, but. For me, the disembodied Birdman voice is never bad, but it just does not reach the same highs as when he is thrust into these uh, confrontations with these other characters. That When the movie is, is pushing two things against each other, it's at its best. Because I think of the scene um, with, with, the, with the reporter, where she's like, I'm going to ruin your show. Mm-hmm. And he gives this impassioned whole speech, and he's like... You're not an actor, you're a celebrity. I think it's really well written, but I think it's all it, it's you need these other characters to make Riggin super interesting because sure. ultimately I don't think that a movie without the people around Riggin is nearly as interesting because famous not. actor becomes divorced from his real life and success gets to his head and he he gets divorced because he was having sex with some other woman and neglects his daughter. It's not a very unique narrative. Yeah. It's the people around him that I think bring the film up. The one thing I would say about this film that I kind of sort of touched on earlier, but another reason why it's one of my personal favorites is it does something that I think that I think more films should do because I like it a lot is Mm. play with the heightened reality of film is this is a grounded story about actors on Broadway, but it's also not. It's also a story where technically this guy could be having this voice of this superhero in his head. And he obviously in reality, he's not actually um, moving things with his mind and stuff, but we're seeing that. And that's an element of film that in, increases the uh, thematics of it. And for me, it's just fun to have this interplay between superpowers and reality. And it is one of the reasons I love superhero films so much or, or films that stray into light fantasy because I feel it does accentuate human emotions in a visually interesting way. And so when you're seeing Birdman fly behind him or you see him step off the roof and then fly uh, through the city, it's a ridiculous moment, but you are better able to understand the emotions of the characters and and what he's going through through the uh, visual interpretation of ridiculous heightened reality superhero quote unquote shenanigans. And it's a great laugh when at the end of his flying sequence, he gets out of the taxi cab in the front of the theater. <laughs> yes. He hadn't paid Hey, yet. what the hell, man? Great you didn't joke. pay me. <laughs> that guy didn't pay me. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, The film, I think, I don't know how much I noticed the comedy while I was watching it. Like, I don't think I was laughing. But now that you guys bring up all these examples and I start thinking back on some of them that I saw myself, I'm like, oh, yeah. All of them? You presumably saw them all. Yeah, we, hopefully. Um, 
this film is full of, of of these very like very humorous and very dark moments of of comedy and mm-hmm. that well next time i watch it i definitely will probably be laughing and be like oh yeah that actually is funny yeah uh it, w- the the very first thing that gets me the first laugh and i just want to bring this up is when they're just doing the scene or whatever and then that guy gets a fucking light dropped on his head just out of absolutely. nowhere it's so shocking it's so and it's so funny <laughs> and then michael keaton's like i made that happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he, and he gets up and he walks away and the the yeah. scene just keeps going. We don't yeah, linger exactly. on the effects of this. We don't even learn that that it was a real thing, but a real thing that hurt this guy and he's going to sue them. We don't learn that till yeah. way later. He just walks off of set and they're like, all right, we need another actor. And it keeps going. Yeah. I think that's a really exactly. great moment. that they don't, yeah. they don't linger on the laughs. That is funny because it's fucking stupid and ridiculous. Yeah. But it is also something that has impacts later on. Mm-hmm. I, I would just say that much like another man film that i watched this year being the batman <gasps> the, the reason the comedy in birdman works is because it's it's witty this movie's just very witty like mm. it, it it knows when to draw upon i just, just, just quickly want to say i can't wait for the birdman in like 30 years with <laughs> with robert pattinson playing Riggin thompson <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be great the remake yes it's it's able to go between really fucking dark and twisted humor like like Edward Norton finally getting an erection after six months in front mm-hmm. of hundreds and hundreds of people who wanted to actually have sex because it'll make, quote unquote, make the scene more real. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's able to write its way into situations like that that are so twisted and so funny, but then also just simpler, but really, I think, satisfying situational comedy. Like, like when they're, when they're at the, when they're in the bar and it's Reagan talking um, to Ed Norton and the the they're talking about how like nobody cares about Birdman like you you were wasting your life and then the, immediately the family comes over to take a picture with Birdman and ask Mike Shiner to hold the camera yeah mm-hmm. like it it just knows how to write these scenarios so smartly yeah um I love that scene because it's I, I think that's the moment where um Mike decides that he's gonna screw over Regan because up until then he was pretty pretty friendly with Regan but then after that after he goes on this tirade of like because Regan's like, I, w- I wanted to be more popular. And Mike's like, oh, popularity is the, the slutty little cousin of prestige. And, you know, no one know- no one cares that you're Birdman here. And then obviously the couple comes over, or, or the family even, because the kid doesn't know who Birdman was. Uh, I think that's the point where Mike is like, he's jealous of that, you know. He's jealous that, uh, you know, he, he has this wide-ranging popularity, uh, even though, th- despite the fact that, Mike is pr- proposes himself to be a real actor, and he has this relationship with um, Tabitha Dickinson, the critic, uh, which is a scene that I also want, that I also really really love that argument between uh, Regan and and the and the critic. But yeah, I think that's the moment where Mike's like, uh, 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 because Regan shares a ve- that very real story of meeting the author of the book and mike can't help but to tear him down a little bit he's like he's fucking drunk man that's why he wrote you this note that you based your entire career off of and i i, I love that mike you know he is he, he he spells it that and i've said this before you know he can't be real he can only be real on stage that he's so miserable in his real life that he that he just has to tear people down to make himself you know feel better or pro- to propel himself to that higher level of being a better actor and being more being recognized as having more prestige than Regan Thompson. They kind of want what the other one has in a exactly in a exactly. twisted way. Yeah, and neither of them will accept it. And, and no. th- th- that conflict between the two of them. Well, what do you what do you guys I, I you know, okay, I want to talk about the sound in this movie cuz oh, yeah. yeah. You Abram, you brought up that scene um where the camera just kind of lingers on the hallway and we get to hear the rest of the performance of a scene that we've already seen play out. Too many words that sound exactly the same happening right now. This scene which we have already viewed happening. Um now we get to hear it happening in a in in it just like the design of it. The film Films like this that have our our single camera moving around provide a really unique challenge for sound guys. It's just straight up difficult to shoot. Like it's really hard to capture all of these things with intricate camera camera moves and whatnot. But I feel like the, the sound design of this film does so much work in telling the story. It actually is just like written into the film in which we hear things that we don't see that propel the story forward. And that is where I'm like, ah, Thank you, screenwriters. You've acknowledged 
that the sound is part of the craft and you can do this. You can think about these things. I'm, this is me ranting in general about filming. You can think <laughs> about sound before your movie is done shooting. You know, you can think about sound at the beginning and impl and, and, and have it be a core part of how you tell the film, just like every fuck another element of filmmaking is a core part of how you tell the film. You know, I think Birdman does a really, really, really excellent job in, you know, using sound, using dialogue, the way that Birdman's voice sounds in, mm -hmm. like, I, I watched it with headphones, but the way that it, even on my headphones, that it pops up in the, it's, it literally sounds like it's coming from the back of my head. And I'm sure in the theater, that effect is even more pronounced. And like, the, there's just like the raspy, like vocal quality to his voice in, and the, Reminds me a lot. Of, I'm going to do an Abram thing. It reminds me a lot of Disco Elysium, a video game which has similar voice acting qualities to the characters that are telling you bad things. Um, I just really enjoy it, and I think that it functions, you know, really, really well throughout the whole film. Good sound. What else? What else can I say? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking um, of bad things, oh. sh shall I give my one criticism of Birdman? Oh. Yeah, I did want to. I did want to get into the ending. So, Abram, I'll, I'll, I'll criticize this perfect film, if you will. Yeah, I don't like the ending. I don't think the mm -hmm. ending works for me. So, now the, this is a this is I I have to make a contradiction as Mister Blade Runner's my favorite film of all time. I have to say that I don't like an em, an ending with pointless ambiguity, mm -hmm. um, and I and I think that this has pointless ambiguity, and and here's the reason that I feel this. I don't think I've been hit by a single motion in a film as strongly in a while as when Riggin pulls out that not that nine millimeter handgun when to bring. The, when he pulls out the handgun and he points it to his head <laughs> and he sh and he shoots himself right on stage. I love that moment. I want to talk about. It. But Abram, please continue. Well, yeah. Audience, listeners. <laughs> Tanner just pulled out a handgun. I have a real gun right here uh, that <laughs> I'm going... At the end of this video, I will kill myself on stage just as Regan Thompson did. My hero, Regan Thompson. <laughs> My hero, <laughs> Regan Thompson. Has a bright, so, a glaringly orange tip on it. No, it doesn't. Yes. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, no, it's Audio real. It's fully it real. Have that. Yeah. So when he pulls out the gun, I think that that's fantastic because I feel in my... I, as we talked about, we haven't talked about it in Quest enough, uh, recently enough, but it was really pulling on my balls when I didn't know, okay, mm -hmm. is, is he really going to kill himself here? Because it, it could have just been a callback to earlier in the film when Ed Norton's like, I'm not scared by your gun because I see the, the the red bit in it. Mm -hmm. So, oh, maybe he's just bringing a, fa a, a, a different looking gun. Then we see him take the magazine out and there are, ac there are actual rounds in it. Yeah. So, okay. So first of all, if I, if I were... A better screenwriter than these people who I and I clearly am right. Yes, yeah. naturally I, I wouldn't have revealed that right then But from an audience's perspective from my perspective, I think this film is Perfect if it ends when he pulls the trigger mm. and 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 Tabitha walks out of the theater My problem is I just think it goes on too long because as soon as we come back up and we're in this, is it real, is it not real, of, oh, he just blew his nose off. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Maybe mm -hmm. he's alive, maybe this is a projection, who knows, who cares. I think that it just becomes kind of muddy, and he, now it's time for the ambiguous ending of, oh, you know, Sam looks out the window, is she looking up, is she looking down, is he dead, is he alive? Oh, there he is in bed, and he's got the... Vi it looks like a bird mask. Okay, I get uh -huh. it. It looks like a bird mask. He takes off the mask. I get it. It just feels like instead of having this incredibly powerful gunshot to end the film, we, we, end, up, we end up in this let's take a little bit of time to unpack stuff. But the unpacking just doesn't feel satisfying to me. It feels like you had that moment of, of tension. You had me. And you communicate, I think, in a much clearer way what you're trying to communicate if it ends with him killing himself. I, I just don't oh. believe. I just don't like the ending. It just does not work for me. It takes me out of the film. Up, 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 Abram. Uh -oh. Up, 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 Abram. No, time yeah. for a rebuttal. <laughs> it's time for a rebuttal, indeed. Um, now, I, I disagree because I think what the the final, the epilogue, if you will, of this story. That's is, a good way to put it. Yes, it, it is a very important part to what I think it is uh, to what one of many things that this film is saying. Um, and it goes back to the conversation between Regan and the art critic, because I think the most important piece of information for me, obviously this, uh, th this epilogue has a lot of thematic, uh, tying things into bows, 
but one of the most important things for me is the positive review that Tabitha gives to Riggins play and his performance saying that because we in if it ended when he when he shoots himself on stage we just see her walk out we don't really know what her thoughts on the film were we construe them to be negative perhaps um but when we get that review of her saying that Regan Thompson has breathed life into the theater by spilling blood on stage, the blood that has been sorely missing from the theater for so long, I think that that ties together the whole thing I was talking about earlier of when you bang it down to a certain level, there is no difference between high art and low art. Because what, she, what, what Tabitha is essentially applauding there is the... It, it is that like monkey lizard brain sort of like I see something real on stage. It makes me feel something, something dangerous, something that you know like, breathes life into me and makes me feel something. That's the exact same thing that Birdman was talking about in that scene where cars are exploding and he's saying this is what people want. They want to feel something in the theater. They want to feel in danger. It's the same thing. And I think that, that that perfectly ties together that sort of note of what Inuritu is saying here, I think, is that we can differentiate between high art and low art, what makes a real actor, what makes a, what makes a fake Hollywood actor. But at the end of the day, all art is about feeling something. And we, we can pretend that things, you know, we, we, we don't look at what a thing is. That's something that gets said in this film quite a few times. Is we, don't get, we don't look at what a thing is. We look at how people react to it. You know what people feel because of it and i think that that moment is is very important and i did want to ask you guys what you what you sort of interpret the ending to be but that can sort of uh that can wait i suppose but that's why i think that epilogue is very very important hmm. i like <clears throat> i like the epilogue mm, I, I feel like it it throws another uh, uh, just another talking point i guess again about this this like theater v film debate is kind of like this I think a surface level thematic reading, because I agree, Tanner, the stuff that you're talking about, like about the nature of performance and the nature of art is a, is a much deeper reading of what is mm -hmm. going on um, in the themes of this film. But the, the theater versus film in the theater, what a batshit thing to say about about the theater being like, oh, the real blood being spilled. Like, I think that is mm -hmm. actually just crazy. I think that is yes. like a nuts, a nutso thing to put in the, in the paper. And so... How does that make me think about the ending? It would be what Regan wants from the mm -hmm. ending. And so it could be his post-mortem visions of what happens and his daughter, him reconnecting, re-embracing with his daughter. Is it too rosy to be real or is it real? I don't really, I, I don't know. I don't even want to choose that it is real or not, to, truth be told. I just kind of want to have it sit there and be like, maybe it's real, maybe it isn't. I think it, I think it still has interesting stuff to say, um, and I my like because I d while I was watching I was I I as a film viewer I just believe whatever is telling me so he's on screen <laughs> he's alive that's how it goes mm -hmm. I, until later then I can think about what it, it what's really going on when he opens that window boom heart drops pit in my stomach my balls are getting yanked again I'm like ah oh, he's he's gonna kill himself for like Makes a third time in this movie mm -hmm. yeah. and so that. You know, th those last moments are the ones that I am really latching onto in my reading of the of the epilogue with Sam, because there is there is resolution in their character arc or is there because did it really happen? I don't know. I, I think the reason that I can't I can't say I wouldn't want the the, ep the quote unquote epilogue as we're referring to it in mm. this film is because I do think there's just there's just too much in there that that does add things to the film. I think Abram, I I understand the ambiguity of him going out the window. Is he up or is he down? Is it real or is it fake? I understand that specific moment being a little bit strange, but the idea of seeing the shot and, and thinking that he's dead and realizing that, okay, we saw blood go everywhere. Oh no, that's just from his nose. Having the bird mask be on, having one final moment with Birdman where he's able to sort of just like, no, I'm not listening to you anymore. Is having that the, the thing... last line of the film where he's like, goodbye and fuck you? Yes. I, it yeah. might be. I can't remember. I think it is. I heard there's, that. There's that. Or no, I guess technically the last line would Sam would be Sam coming into him. Dad, dad, where are oh, you? Okay. you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, but, no, remember, she looks at the window and she goes, what is that? Some kind of bird man? What is that? Some kind of... But, and then the title card comes up. <laughs> uh, well, 
There's also sorry, a few more things, sorry, as I was going to yeah. say. I, I do think that the, the commentary, as Abram was saying, about the only way to really be popular, it, it, because the move, world moves so fast, is to do something drastic, is to be outside in your underwear or or attempt suicide on stage. Like There is a commentary about that, how everyone's holding vigil, how Reagan Thompson's the biggest thing in the world. Uh, he has a, a Twitter page now because Sam made it. Also, that Zach Galifianakis' character, like, just talks about the fact that this is the greatest thing that you could have done. Like, this is what we needed. Like, there's so many bits of commentary in there. And as T- uh, Tanner was saying, I think the most, uh, most poignantly, the, the review that he gets, all these things do add a lot to the texture of the film. And like, if, if this five minute scene on the end has like 10 things in it that adds them in the film, I, I, I don't think it can be cut. See, I just think that, I just don't think we learn anything that an and that an engaged viewer wouldn't know already. If 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 he gets shot and it cuts and then you just see it just pulls up for one more shot and it's a stack of of copies of the Times and the, on the front it says the blah 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 whatever it actually says and the movie ends there it accomplishes the same thing because we know what that positive review is going to mean to Reagan if he gets it. We don't need to see him take off that bird mask to understand that that's him. Ah, and he did it, right? We don't we don't need explicitly Jake to come and tell us this stuff. I just think that in a film that to use another quest word that has gone silent, the subtleism of the narrative mm. is broken in my opinion by that ending. And I just think that you let me let me sit with the gunshot, let me sit with the headline, and then I will reach I think probably the same conclusion without an unnecessary degree of ambiguity. So you know, Abram, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree uh, w- w- once again with you here. I, no, I we we agree on like 99 percent of this film, so I don't I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here. But I think that I think the point of that is that Regan doesn't care about the review. Is that he he doesn't care he doesn't care anymore. Uh, what he cares about, as as Timo points out, is sharing that moment with his daughter. Is you know finally reconciling with her, which he which he failed to do for 25 years of her life. I don't think that he cares about what a critic thinks about him anymore because um mm-hmm. I, I, and I found I found the I found the note on uh, the, uh, the line that I was referring to uh there's a note on Regan's uh mirror before he goes down stage for down, down on the stage for a final time that says a thing is a thing not what we th- not what we think of it uh Something, something I, along I, those lines, yeah. It's something along those lines. I, mean, I, I butchered I said I had it but I butchered it whatever. Um but yeah, I don't think he cares what people think of his performance anymore. And that's why I kind of interpret that epilogue to be a, I think, I guess you would say a death dream of, of, uh, of Regan's because, uh, I, I don't know if I do, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. Wrestling yeah. with the ambiguity, are you, buddy? You, yeah, I don't yeah, want. Yeah. I don't want to decide. I want it to be yeah, left sure. up Fair to enough. nothing. Fair enough. To to, yeah. to to be, you know, maybe next time Abram. I'll find some clue that tells me. But maybe I don't even want those clues to be there. Yeah. yeah. See, but like, go watch a Birdman oh, and ahead. explain. But I, I mean, I guess this is this is getting <laughs> this is getting into my most subjective the ways I enjoy film, or subsequently, or conversely, mm. don't enjoy film. But don't just leave me on the. Hmm. And is it real? Is it not real? Because I ultimately don't think French that there's connection. any. I don't think there's any way to intuit based on what is in there if it is real or not real. Hmm. And that thing, the whole is the, the reason I brought up Blade Runner is decorated replicant or not? Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. I think that I think Blade Runner is better for you knowing what Ridley Scott's intention was, Be, because then it has a purpose to it. And I, I suppose just the the fact that I do not think that there is anything in that final scene that suggests to me in a material way this is real or not real, that just ends up feeling unsatisfying to me. When you had such a satisfying moment before, I think that's where I ultimately come down on it. Sure. Uh, I think for I, me, I, it's... I, I want to redeem myself here. I found the quote. It's, a thing is a thing, not what is said of that thing. Sure. Rede- yes, redemption sorry. gained. Re- redemption right. gained. I did it. Congratulations, do, me. Do you have, by the way, Tanner, the trivia about what the ending was originally going to be? Uh, no, I don't. Please. Oh, I, I think Tucker has something to say, though. So I, I like. No, I just, I just want to quickly mention that I think it's actually quite similar to me. In I don't have strong feelings either way about the specific ending shot where that mm-hmm. where I think the ambiguity comes in is if Sam looks down or up like that moment. I think is where the ambiguity comes in. I, I frankly, I think he survived. I think he shot off his nose. I think all that happened. Um, yeah. But I, I think it's quite similar to the ending of The Shape of Water, where yeah. does does she get the gills? Does she swim away? Is this is this a fantasy? Is this real? Is it a dream? Mm-hmm. That specific ending moment that I think adds a, a touch of fantasy 
to the film. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've had touches of fantasy across the entire yeah. film so far, but leaving it on that touch of fantasy, I think is is important for me because while I don't love the ending, I don't I don't think of it extremely either way. I think I think it's kind of nice to introduce or to leave the film on a note of maybe there is fantasy in the world. Maybe maybe things can have this this hopeful dreamlike quality to mm -hmm. it because 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 the film's been bashing you in the nuts with a hammer for the entire. It's been like a little guy <laughs> behind you hitting you in the nuts oh, with a little tiny little hammer. Little well, tiny uh, little hammer. <laughs> yeah, the whole film with with negativity and nihilism and mm -hmm. and and characters who are basically all assholes across the board. That leaving it on a note of of levity, levity, whimsy, fantasy. I I think is something that I I like films to do because I do think that it calls into contention why we go to films to see something that we can't see otherwise like for me that that makes a lot of sense but i can i can understand it not feeling right but i, I do think it's an important moment of the film let me clarify that this is my difference between giving the film a 10 or not a 10 so it's not like this is the make or break if i think sure, it's a sure, good sure, movie sure. or not yeah yeah but yeah, let yeah. me read what this original ending was going to be this comes from collider and speaking of giving it a 10 or not a 10 pull up your scores while Abram oh, yeah. reads Ooh. Uh, appearing on Jeff Goldsmith's podcast via the film stage with other Oscar-nominated screenwriters, Birdman co-writer Alex uh, Denelarius, sorry, revealed the sorry, original yeah. conclusion to the film. <gasps> Quote, So we had one other ending that was satirical. The other ending was that he shoots himself on stage. The camera comes around to the audience in the standing ovation all the way around, um, like Chivo and Alejandro did the whole time. And then the and the segue was back onto the stage and onto the and on the stage was like James Lipton or Charlie Rose and Michael Keaton sitting across from him and he's sort of reading the review. He's saying, "Oh my God, you got this tremendous review." And Michael is like, "Yeah." Uh, he continues by saying that they would have brushed past the, this encounter to, to reveal a pretty massive cameo. Quote. Mm -hmm. Then the camera, proud like it did the whole film, went backstage through the halls we've seen the whole time and would get to the dressing room where literally Johnny Depp would be sitting, looking in the mirror and putting on his Regan Thompson wig, and then the poster of Pirates of the Caribbean 5 would be in the back. Jack Sparrow's voice, it would say, uh, what the fuck are we doing here, mate? It was going to be the satire of the endless loop of that. Uh, Denilaris Del concludes with a laugh, quote, we couldn't get Johnny Depp or even the poster. <laughs> um, I think I, obviously that's that's a, a description of it and not the real ending. But I think I probably would have hated that. That sounds really convoluted. I don't that know. That would have been fucking insane if that's yeah, what happened. <laughs> yeah. I think there's also a fun to that, but obviously it didn't have it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I've got, um, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> give us, I'm going give to us the I'm real ending. Give this. us the real ending. I'm gonna okay. filibuster this for a bit longer because I have a th few more things in trivia and a few things that I didn't bring up. So. Uh, we didn't bring up Zach Galifianakis. He's great. I love the scene where he like lies to him that Z that Martin Scorsese is going to be in the audience or whatever. Scorsese. Yeah. Sco Scorsese. Scorsese. <laughs> uh, He's really um, funny. Uh, we didn't bring up. I don't He's think we talked about Emma. I don't. <laughs> I don't think we talked about Emma Stone enough. She's fantastic as that like nihilistic twenty something. Uh, I brought her up in relation to Mike Shiner, but she's fantastic in the scenes with Michael Keaton as well, where she basically tells him exactly what he needs to realize about himself and his career and his life. And he's like, ah, I got to go do the play. Uh, but I, uh, that's great. Um, in in regards to the the iconic scene of Michael Keaton walking through Times Square in his tidy whities uh, it was filmed uh, after midnight so that the amount of real bystanders caught on camera in the shot would be limited and that the majority of the people in the frame are hired extras or crew members. So, unfortunately, that was not real footage of people reacting to Michael Keaton in Times Square in his undies. So, that's that, that's quite unfortunate. Um, and, and one last thing. Uh, Why is that given unfortunate? The, uh, I, I would have liked to see, you know, what, what if it was real people Where Where's there? your love for cinema verite, Tucker? Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry, Andre Bazan, I do not put no. my faith in the image. <laughs> uh, Edward Norton and Michael Keaton kept a running tally of flubs made by the actors and actresses. Emma Stone made the most mistakes, while Zach Galifianakis made the fewest. He actually did mess up a few lines during the filming, but played his mistakes off so well that the shots were included in the film. I do love that it, there are a few moments where you can, like, they don't, they just like messed up a line. They just messed up a line a little bit, but it feels real. It feels like you know people start saying something, they change their mind, and then they start saying something else. I think it's cool that they did that. Yeah, the performances and, uh, surprise, surprise, feel very real. Yeah. Yes. Very true. Very Any very final true. Things? Um, you know, at the end of the day, these are all just uh, crappy opinions based on even crappier uh, comparisons. You know, we're we're, we're, not, we're not risking anything here. We're not real. You know, That's we're not risking point. anything real. Quest is fake.
Quest is fake. Where, where, where's where's, where's your than... creation instead of your criticism? Let's create exactly. something by <gasps> scoring this list. That's what we're creating yes. is a list. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I've got my number. My number is my locked number. and loaded. I'm ready to hit hit go. You do have your number tenor? I have it. I'm ready. I've had this number since before well, I, quite, but since before sure? I watched the movie. Are you sure you have it in the spot though? Yeah, there it doesn't right. look like it's it in, in the, the spot now. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop. Calculating, calculating. Calculating, calculating. And mm, man, very high, I will say. Very high to start mm, it off. Mm. The average score. Nine point eight. Very high up there, nine point eight three. If you want to really get into it, nine point eight two five. If you want to go even further, but what? I don't. Wow, you zowie! <laughs> we might not need to do that. The point breakdown at the top of at the top of the point breakdown. Two people st- sitting on top of each other right now gave it a ten. Tucker and Tanner both love Gosh, this movie. Up top. At, up top. Yeah. For the audio <laughs> listeners. <laughs> <laughs> And they're trying to high five. Abram gave yeah. it a nine point seven, and I gave it a nine point six. So I hated it. quite united. I mean, besides from little small differences, but those yeah. are minor differences. Let's see. Minor differences, indeed. Where a nine point eight lands us is actually going to put this very, 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 very high up on the list Ooh. at second place. Second a tenth of a place. point away from taking first. Or tying yeah. for first. Now that would have yeah. been crazy if we had to debate that in Schindler's list. Oh, good I don't lord! Think I, I don't think I, I don't, don't think do my that. little heart could take it. I'd I don't want to do pull that. Out, I, I'd have to pull out the nine here and uh, <laughs> and <laughs> and make it an uneven number here on Quest. <laughs> Thankfully, right. Tanner, for your yeah, sake and comedy. for ours, yeah. um, you don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. Birdman or the unexpected virtue of ignorance is going to go very high up on our list. Place number two. Welcome new place number two. Wow. Howdy, howdy. It replaces uh, which one, Timo? Unseating Parasite. Parasite's now going down to our number three spot on the list. So this puts uh, the, 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 20, the 20 teens, the mm-hmm. 90s, and the 70s. Very, very highly represented in our top six um, actually, our top six films only come from three decades. Interesting. Yep. Hmm. Little, well, little movies of our lifetime are better than old movies because they look nicer. And exactly. Which, of course, yeah, we were I, alive when The Godfather came out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know the people in them, so therefore they are better. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. my, can I just say, the, the this film, Birdman is just made all the better by the fact that Michael Keaton is returning as Batman in The Flash. Not uh, only that, uh, he was he was Vulture like, yeah, exactly. three, two years yeah, after yeah. this was shot. Yeah. Can I also say that I was going to give this movie a four until I noticed the Man of Steel iconography in the background? <laughs> the real Jesus Jesus imagery. Thank you, Zack Snyder. <laughs> do, you know, guys, do you guys know that Zack Snyder invented Jesus? That's pretty nice. Rebel Moon is filming, and I'm not going to shut up about it when the movie comes out. Oh my. He's not shutting about it now. Let's go to the, the polls. Film. The spin wheel. Tanner, you ready? Yes, I will. I, I, as I, I'm, I'm going to put this away. Uh, you, the, the high score for Birdman, uh, you know, means he no rejuven- longer has to threaten us at gunpoint. Yes, rejuvenated my faith in, uh, in my acting abilities and my singing abilities. I'm just like Regan Thompson, but for singing the Quest song. <laughs> so let's do it, shall we? Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Give us a movie that makes us squeal. Is it on digital? Is it on real? Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? And the wheels deal is numero 16. Oh. Zexish for all you German speakers out there. <laughs> what could that film possibly be? This film continues our streak of just giving me the movies that I love. Because, of mm. course, we're talking today about the 1960. 1960- <laughs> Well, you know, in the in next the week, next well, week, we will be talking about it for a little bit today as we vamp oh. towards the end of this episode. Yeah. Uh, the 1964 Best Picture winner, directed oh, by here. George Cukor. Yeah, of course. Uh, starring Rex Harrison and Audrey Hepburn, we'll be watching My Fair Lady. Oh, a little Fair musical action lady. for us here today. Yeah. Some might say the best musical that has won Best Picture. Oh, well, that remains to be seen, of course. That remains to be seen. Uh, we, we've had some old musicals before that, you know, haven't really tickled my fancy. Oliver Twist. Or I, I think just Oliver. 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 Uh, and, Oliver. And uh, Gigi. 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 Uh, that those were, haven't really been for me, but I'm hopeful for My Fair Lady because you know Aubrey Hepburn is is one of those all time classic people in movies. I don't know what they call them nowadays. Back in my day, they called them actors. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Birdman has broken movies. my brain. 
So I, I'm, I'm the only has. one here who's seen this. I mm-hmm. recommend yes. it. So I've seen it. No, I don't fuck with you. <laughs> Is that Any Abra final Hepburn thoughts one? on this? Yeah, it's Abra Hepburn. Yeah. She learns to not be so British or whatever, right? Yeah, which means it's a really based movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm looking forward I'm to excited. watching this one. We will uh, we'll get in the musical spirit once again. It's, I'm very surprised. Tucker's already singing the praises of this singing movie, which yep. wow, already out of the a expected. A singy. We've got movies where they move around, and we've got talkies where they talk around and singies. <laughs> they sing around, yeah. Indeed, we, we gotta have. get out of this video. <laughs> yep, we do. We've gone on pretty long, so let's just wrap it up. I'm looking forward to My Fair Lady. Thank you for I'm discussing not... uh, Birdman. I'm gonna ignore that. And uh, welcome, welcome, Birdman, to the pantheon of the top, the top ten, the top five, mm-hmm. the top three, the top two. Even we yep. got a new number two even. film. That's actually a pretty big thing to to celebrate. It's a big deal. So, man, what and really, what a, what an excellent film for it to 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 sit at that number two spot. I think that out of all of the films on our list, Birdman being this high is going to be one of the least contentious things about it. Mm-hmm. This is a widely beloved film, and now I understand mm-hmm. why. Truly. All right. Well, we will see if My Fair Lady stacks up next week on the quest for the bestest. Thank you guys for joining me, and we will see you then. Peace. Cause you know in Smash they have like the splash screens when they review. Yeah, yeah. he's like, the solid snake commits war crimes into the fight <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah.